The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and this week we're diving into our fourth Advice Tech feature episode where we sort of discuss broader ideas and issues the industry is facing, particularly when it comes to tech, of course. Now, today's feature topic is a follow-on from our previous episode a couple of weeks ago where Rachel and I from NetWealth discussed sort of the combo of humans and machines in the industry um, and what's happening with AI. And so there's been so much discussion on the Ensemble platform about AI and using it and what apps and all sorts of things that we figured we should take this a little further. And so we've brought in some advisors and practitioners in to talk more about AI and technology and really see what their take was. So joining me here today is he's an investment manager for his clients he's, who is a partner as, as part of a larger firm based in Melbourne CBD, who also successfully completed the Chartered Financial Analyst exams. And if you don't know what they are, they've got a pass rate of about 35%. He also has a law degree. So I figure he's a sucker for punishment amongst all of that study that he's managed to do. <laughs> and beside him, we've got an advisor who includes coach in his title. So does some money coaching as well, runs his own advice pr- business and was in fact one of the first in the country to go fully virtual as a practice. I'm really excited about the broad spectrum of insights and business types we've got here today. Thank you so much much for joining me on the show, Tristan Bowman and James Millard. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Woo! Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you for having us. Not at all. And dude, that study, I've just got us, Tristan, <laughs> that analyst exam, I've got mates that did it. I nearly did. I was in mergers and acquisitions actually before I moved to an advice and I nearly started that process. Got to say I'm a little relieved I didn't. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure if I knew what I was signing up for when I right? started it. But yeah, it, it's a it's a great uh, great program, and I you know, fully commend it to uh, anyone who's thinking about doing it out there. It is really cool. I remember back in the day, and of course I'm a little older than you, you fresh young faces there. But back in my day, so we're talking. Oh God, I really am old. Thirty years ago, it was actually negative marking. I don't know whether it was when you did it, but if you got something wrong, that was a negative mark as well. And so, <laughs> the chances of yeah. you getting through it if you didn't really know your stuff was pretty slim. Yeah, uh, they always are very guarded on how they actually mark it, so you never really know. Okay. Um, all you get told is whether you pass or fail. Okay. <laughs> Good. Isn't that interesting? You go into it completely blind. They don't tell you how to do it, and uh, you didn't really look at too much into what what you were doing in the first place, which is probably a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. just hope. Yeah. Know your stuff. Turn up. Fingers crossed. Less right? is more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now I'm really keen to sort of k- kick off a discussion we've got here. We've got a lot of great stuff to talk about, but let's ease us in. The listeners know where I'm going with with this. We get to know you as users personally of technology. So let's start with you, James. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do regularly. Um, and to be honest, I've got to say it's a little bit of a mix of the crazy face, the wink face. Yeah. And the rocket. I'm very partial to nice. a rocket. Nice. Yeah. Go hard or go home. I'm <laughs> liking it. How about you, Tristan? Have you got a, um, a regularly used emoji? 
Yeah, probably the face palm is, is my favourite at the mm-hmm. moment. Um, mm-hmm. Not sure whether that's indicative of uh, uh, you know, how we're going with two young kids aged three and one, but there oh. seems to be a lot of face farming between uh, my wife and I. Yeah, that's fair. I'm sure James can empathise with that. Totally. Well, your kids are a little older, but I, I'm sure you remember very specifically how that was. The face palms, I don't think, disappear at time. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Tristan was hoping for some reassurance. <laughs> I apologize. Now, right. James, how about for you with, you know, smartphones, we've all got them all the time. You know, if you had to get rid of all the apps off your smartphone, what three apps would you keep? So the boring answer is Slack. We yep. we're we're now running everything communication wise with the team on Slack. Um and Spotify for me. Mm. So if I had to choose two, it's those two. I think um there's a bit of a combo of I do I'm partial to social media and I'd probably have the Instagram on there for a bit of entertainment. Yep. But uh, yeah, Spotify to keep the tunes pumping. Nice. How about you, Tristan? Yeah, I think James has hit the nail on the head there. Definitely Spotify. Uh, probably BorrowBox, which is what I use for audio books. That's a that's a good one. Um, and then you know perhaps the ABC Listen app for this time of year when the cricket's on. Nice BorrowBox. So is that sort of like library for audio? <laughs> Books. Yeah, it's free free audio books. It's oh, right. No, it's yeah. actively writing down right now, listener, as somebody who oh, look. I yeah. the thing is, I I would need a speed up function. I find audio books are often read a bit slow for me. So as long as it's got a way I can speed up, the, you know, the, the, how fast they talk, I'm in um, for yeah, sure. I'm, I'm less I'm listening to the Arnold Schwarzenegger book at the moment, and um, yeah, he needs to speed up a bit so you can yeah. do that. You're right. You're like, come on, let's get to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So the NetWealth session at November's All Licensee PD Day, which can you believe it was a few months ago now, was an explore- exploration of how sort of AI is really revolutionising the advice landscape, um, you know, supercharging all of our expertise, what we can get to, and potentially also empowering our clients to achieve their financial goals. Now, you know, NetWealth also brought out their report, Humans and Machines. Um, and we're sort of going to use that as a bit of a reference point today for our discussion. And listener, if you haven't read the Human and Mach- Humans and Machines report, then we've included the link in the episode show notes. I would encourage you to check it out. This is a bit of a, a departure from the normal advice tech report, which you will have seen before and NetWealth is still doing. This is specifically on AI and how this will all work in the future. Now, I'm not sure any of us here today would call ourselves AI experts. Is that fair? We're not experts. Absolutely. You know, we're sort of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think we probably all would safely say it's not a fad, right? I mean, it's something that it's something that more than tech geeks need to be aware of. You know, I can't think of any businesses that aren't going to need to have some sort of AI strategy going forward. Would you agree? Yep. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think yeah. uh, the fad of two or three years ago was, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Right. That seems to have disappeared reasonably quickly. Yeah. Uh, but I think AI is here to stay. And I, th- I, I think, you know, AI has been around for, for a long time. I think mm. chat GPT kind of revolutionized it and brought it to the public sphere uh, very quickly. I think AI will be the norm in 10 years' time. I think we probably won't be having these conversations. It will just be part of our daily lives. Um much like you know Microsoft Excel is now, um, yeah. and that would have been revolutionary whenever that was uh, created. But I do think it is here to stay. It's it's not a fad. It's going to be something that business, consumers, um, governments uh, need to get used to and uh, plan and prepare for. Definitely, and and yeah, totally agree. Yeah, James. So so are you sort of seeing it? Like it's just going to be broader than professional services, right? This is everybody's just going to have to get their head around it. If you own a business or a part of a business, you're just going to have to gradually get your head around it, right? Yeah, and I think as soon as you dive in, you're all of a sudden you realise how capable it is. Yeah, and and for for a complete novice to walk in and just start playing with it is very simple. When you know things like Chat GPT bring it bring it to the fore, and and I guess as a result of that, then we end up with these, you know, the fact that I mean, we work with a business coaching community and. There's a, whole, a lot of diverse businesses and everyone's attacking it from different angles and it's kind of cool to see how the IT guys are doing it and how all these guys are, you know, someone's built a, a LinkedIn AI function that kind of sinks into that and then goes and goes and builds your connections, right? There's wow. some really cool stuff happening and I think 
um, yeah, the, I mean, the short answer is it's not going anywhere. It's no, just, it's, it's not, right? I mean, it's – and I think, look, listen, there's a there's a whole lot of vernacular that goes with this. There's artificial intelligence, generative AI, there's learning systems, there's all sorts of stuff that will be lang- – all of which I'm going to get wrong. I can confidently say I'll put the one wrong one in the wrong expression. But Rachel did cover a fair bit of that in the previous episode. So I think it's a couple of episodes ago. Definitely link to that or listen to that. Um, and what's – cool about that is Rachel herself was in no way an expert on this stuff. She's just immersed herself as part of being at NetWealth. And so her view is if she can understand this stuff, we all can. So as we go, please excuse our uh, less than expert status here. This is tr- going to be a conversation of just how we've all experienced this, right? And how you may be able to get some insights from uh, the collective experience between the three of us. So let's start at the beginning then. When generative AI started uh, coming out, it was sort of during 2023 in the public sphere. I'm curious, and James, let's start with you. How quickly did you start to play with it with like ChatGPT? I guess as soon as we stumbled across it, as soon as it was, like I think if I looked at it on the calendar, it was probably about Feb 23. Right. Um, so really as soon as we heard about it, we were curious, starting to dabble, uh, didn't really know the power uh, and, and where it might be able to take us. But yeah, as soon as you start to listen and look and learn and there's, there are experts out there that really talk this up in a way. Uh, mm. And to, to the naysayers, I think just spending a bit of time listening to that might freak them out a little bit, but yeah. there's a lot happening and, yeah, I think maybe 12 months. Yeah, okay, okay. How about you, Tristan? When you, Do you remember when you sort of started f- first dabbling? Uh, yeah, so the, the younger members of the team uh, were probably – ahead of the curve compared to uh, older members like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, they were using it for, for research um, purposes, you know, perhaps you know, close to, to 12 months ago yep. now. Um, I think it, it's been interesting seeing how quickly it has pro- progressed in terms of what you can do uh, with you know, things like GPT. Um, yeah. We then, uh, we then had a, a little competition um, in our building, they do a, a, a competition on a Friday where they had out vouchers for local restaurants and um, things like that. And we all uh, had a go at instructing G- Chat GPT to give us a, a spiel on, I think it was a, a tra- the, you know, best travel story. Um, and one of our senior analysts uh, won it. So I think it, it is really all about how you can um, give the instruction to it, um, and I think a lot of people have uh, been able to master that pretty quickly because um, yeah. it, it's really only as good as the the user is. Oh, so so true. And I think, like I remember when the internet first started, and we all started using it, and it applied here too. We all started with really naff things, like asking it to write a silly birthday card or something in in yep. Shakespearean language, or like that's what I did first up. It was all really naff stuff. And it wasn't then until actually I found LinkedIn was really helpful with this. I started following some of the sort of perceived experts or people putting together prompts and stuff. And that made a huge difference. Once you get those sort of prompts, then I was diving a lot deeper into what it could do. Yep. And you're so right. You know, it, the quality in brings the quality out. Um, and so, you know, I've become a bit of an expert at hunting for prompts. You know, I'm really good at, at finding tips on prompts. So I'm curious, yeah. Tristan, how much is it part of either your working day or the team's working day now? Is it a, is it an is it an everyday thing now for you? Yeah, I think I think it probably is an, an everyday thing for uh for those junior members of the yep. team. Um not not me personally. Yep. Um uh, I'm kind of looking at it more from um, an in integration with Microsoft Office, Copilot, which right. we might touch on uh, yeah. a bit later. But as I said before, it's, it's a really great educational tool. So it's got data up until January 2022 at this yep. stage. Um, so there, there's a really good uh, bank of historical information and data. Um, it doesn't quite have that you know, current edge to it right now. Um, yeah. But if you were to ask it to give a summary on, you know, capital stacking, uh, a company, you know, comparing covered bonds and subordinated debt and things like that, it does a really good job of that. So yeah. if you're a graduate and you've just come into the business or if you're an intern working here, um, you know, it's a, it's a great resource to, um, you know, use as a really a, a research library. 
Yeah. And that's interesting, actually, because you've just prompted me on something I probably haven't considered using it for yet is it's so it's got all of that insight up to that point, which is fairly recent. I mean, it's not as recent we like, and they'll do an update at some point. But, you know, if there's some sort of market movement that feels out of the norm that happens up or down, then to ask it to give examples historically and some context historically of what was going on either on in the world or for Australia at the time of that similar movement, like those sort of insights without us having to do the digging of it's ourselves just to get you started. It's like, oh, no, that's yeah. what happened in the 80s or that's what happened in, you know, like that's fantastic, particularly, like you say, for young staff, right, who won't have experienced that. They weren't there when markets were doing that. Um, yep. But those analogies are really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How about you, James? Are you how regularly are you now sort of using whether it's ChatGPT or other sort of generative AI? You, is it day to day yet for you? I'd say it probably is now. I mean, for me, it's any time I want to draft something and fix something up or tweak yeah. something, do the research, those types of things. Uh, we were we were sitting on very patiently on the wait list for ChatGPT four, and and that finally came through. I think just before Christmas, and so when that did, um, yeah. we were. We were then looking. Well, what could we load into this? Is was the next step, and really like and and simple things like a PDS, right? So the insurance PDS, and then when the client comes asking, "Hey, what about this? Can I claim on this part? Or what about this little like slight little tweak that you're not going to know off the top of your head necessarily if you're across eight different insurance companies? Yeah, but you can load that stuff in and have it in there already. Uh, so so yeah, we I mean we're using it for. Things like drafting emails and and supporting the admins function, yeah, um, yeah. But then you know, as Tristan alluded to, it's more of a okay. Well, what about the innovation in the business? The, the true stuff. Or what? Where's the future going to be? And what else can we do with it? Yeah, that, um, we're starting like on and Tash, uh, and a few of us are starting to dedicate a little bit more time to, yeah, uh, far more than we used to. Actually, on the net wealth side of things, I remember when Matt Heiner spoke. It was probably eight years ago or something at. At maybe it was a, an IFA excellence day or something yep. like that where he was talking about the percentage of time as a business that you should func- should focus on the kind of five years plus. Yes. And I think what chat GPT AI has done now is it's shortened that time frame. Really now we need to be thinking about, well, in 12 months' time, where the hell is this going to be? Yeah. And as a percentage of time that we're focusing on all the different engine rooms of the business, the innovation function has I think now become far more important because if you miss it, it's not like catch up on the internet a few years later. This yep. is gonna it's gonna leave us behind. Yeah, and the it's interesting, isn't it? Because the you're so right. What it's done is is um, sort of accordioned the five years into one. You know, it's like all those things we thought might take five years to happen. It's like no, that's all going to happen within a really short space of time. So you're sort of forced to adjust and. You just can't underestimate the bandwidth it can give you if you do this, if you use it well, if you just bother to spend a little bit of time. I mean, I love the idea of competitions, you know, even to have one internally to say, all right, you know, who can come up with and give them a mission and then have some sort of prize, like let encourage the team to sort of, you know, investigate this stuff because they think differently too, don't they? Like each team member is going to think very differently about stuff. And I mean, for me, but people, a lot of people are saying, oh, I don't want to pay for ChatGPT. You know, why should we have to pay? I'm like, it has been worth every dime I've spent and it's not that much anyway, but it saved hours, like hours of time for me. Um, and even now for me, on a, it probably is day to day, but I, for me, I, I curse myself when I forget to use it. You know, when I get through something, I'm like, Peter, why are you making this so hard? So I've got this little sticky note on the computer. It's like, what would be the prompt for this task? <laughs> <laughs> on my computer. So I forced myself to go, Peter, have you bothered trying to shortcut this? So, you know, I think it sounds like for all of us, it is various levels, but interestingly, quite different applications, um, which I like. So yeah. if we sort of go to, um, and folks, if you're listening along and you've got the net wealth report there, the uh, humans and machines report, then on page, I think it's page 10 there, they sort of basically break down the key areas of all of our businesses where AI could and probably will be applied. Um, and I'm curious for each of you, and Tristan, we'll, we'll kick off with you. Where do you sort of sit in terms of, you know, whether you, the, you know, the business is using AI now in those, a generative AI particularly, but AI now in each of those sections or plan to? Like where are you guys sitting in terms of those sort of six broad categories? Yeah, so uh, over the past uh, probably two years, we've put a lot of effort into 
automating back office functions and just try and make things a bit smoother yeah. and easier for our for our staff to to navigate through and re- really just reduce the friction um, in uh, everyone's workload. So yeah. I think the the admin piece is probably one part that we can apply generative AI to. And then the the second part would be making the client experience as seamless as possible and uh, having AI support advisors to be able to uh, reduce the amount of time preparing documents, whether it's uh, an advice piece or a presentation or a uh, a piece of modeling or an interpretation of uh, data. Uh, I think that's a, another another piece. And then lastly, mm. uh, in terms of the investment research for, for our portfolios, um, we need to all of our investment uh, directly into equity markets or bond markets. Um, so I think we were, we were having this conversation yesterday uh, internally where it was a, a specific meeting to to figure out what technology we're going to be using and, yeah. and want to be researching further into. Um, and we thought, well, perhaps uh, Copilot might be a tool we can use to summarize earnings call transcripts, right. um, things like that. So just uh, the, the time saving in, in that research uh, part of the business. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, research is um, – there's a lot of collection. Yeah, so, so finding information, sort of collecting it together, curating it, and then interpreting, you know, and what's interesting is at the very least the first two steps can probably be done by some sort of machine, AI or otherwise, and even yeah. interpreting – there'll be a level of interpreting you could train it to do at least initially or even the way it gives you the information. You know, it could be in a certain way that's, that you then look at and then you can take insight from. So I'm with you there in terms of research. We probably um, are making it a bit hard for ourselves in some of those things that we make a bit manual, don't we, when we probably can really streamline them. Yeah, and, and we, uh, we've we used Bloomberg for over 10 years now, even you know, probably close to, to 20 years. And that's a, that's a great source of information. You can filter data easily. Uh, this kind of just takes it to the next level in terms of distilling uh, qualitative information um, and verbal information as well, yeah. which previously haven't been able to do. I think that's a really key point when you talk about the get it from the source that's correct instead of like Bloomberg, for example, instead of going to ChatGPT to start it off potentially. Right. So when you're talking about the research and the history, right, you're getting it from a trusted source yeah. and then you're taking it to the AI because, I mean, I know from from just chatting with mates, I've got a mate who has done his PhD, spends a lot of time environmental science focused, so spends a lot of time writing articles and, and we were just mucking around with this the other day and he said, look, just write an introductory three paragraphs to this including citations and everything else. And so it goes off, searches Bing, searches everywhere else around the internet. This is chat 4 and comes back with an incredibly well-written intro. All the citations were wrong. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so research, you've got to be careful which way you start, but if Bloomberg's yeah. a trap and source, obviously that's <laughs> a bad way to go. And that, that's a really good point, James, and something for people to be wary of because the, the temptation – I think now it, everyone has so much information at their fingertips and is getting fed so much information that it's easy to just accept what you see and what looks correct. So, you know, James, there's something there that's, you know, got citations. Okay, yeah, that great. Must but, be real, yeah. <laughs> but, but people don't really take the time to look into the details. So, yeah, you got to be you got to be careful with that. And I think it's an, it's um it's why actually taking the time to just um, immerse yourself a bit and and dig a d- bit deeper and sort of understand the concepts of these tools is really important because um, to me, the strength of actually, I think the future tools will be in how narrow they are and the info they have. So, so you know, ChatGPT is, is sort of, you know, the everything. <laughs> like it's, it's looking at everything that's available on the web, right? So yeah. it filters through all of it with all of its biases and gaps and all sorts of stuff. Whereas I actually think the the power in these tools going forward are when James, to your example, we give it we give an AI tool, so maybe our own version, our own GPT. We give it certain information, and then we we can interact with it and ask it questions, right? And I think then that's a different story. That's just 
that's just empowering, right? That's just getting a quick answer, like you say on the PDS. Or I mean, I'm seeing a tool um, recently called Coach Vox, and what it gets you to do as a coach, so you could be a business coach or a money coach or whatever type of coach you are, you upload all of your insight and program. Maybe you've got a book, whatever it is about the way you do things and the way you coach things, and it creates a AI version of you that people can interact with that just uses that information and answers their questions. You know, that's interesting, yeah, right? Wow. That's yeah, really yeah. interesting because if that means somebody at 2 a.m. when they're trying to look at something needs a bit of motivation or whatever and it can answer, knowing that it's AI, it can answer and give some sort of response, you know, but but once again, that's a narrower data range, right? That's something you've specifically given yeah. it. So I've got to admit that's one of the ones for client services. I think there's going to be some power here for client services on specific questions they have. Yeah. Did you say Coach Vox? Coach Vox, V-O-X. Oh. Right, yes. Um, yeah, well, that was really interesting to me. I think the other one that um, just came across my radar is um, anybody who's seen me speak will who have heard me mention Guru, which is basically our IP in the practice. It's it's how we do everything, and it sits in in the web for for my team, and we can ask it about things. But you've got to have put up in, you know, this is our policy on this, or this is how you access access this tool, or this is the number you ring if you want to ring a provider. Or, you know, we just put all of that in there. What they've done is added AI so it, if you connect it to, say, our Slack, which we also use, then it doesn't just look in Guru, it looks in Slack. So it means you can ask it more specific questions about specific instances or things that have come up. So it, it literally can be the what, what should I know about this thing sort of funnel through all of the interactions um, for the team. And so, you know, that to me is really powerful too on an admin side to really empower them to not have to dig or ask or, or you know, remember that somebody mentioned that, you know, two months ago. Um, these tools will just give it all, you know, at our fingertips, um, which I'm a bit excited. Those two things for me, client services and admin, I think will be really powerful um, yep, and be able agree. to add some real value. I'm making notes now, Peter. We <laughs> use Guru, but we've only recently switched to Slack. Uh, and so there's a, there's an immediate item to Yeah, uh, it, it was literally just an announcement now from Guru. So it just came out. Um, so I haven't even turned the thing on yet, but you can connect it to a few things. And so I'm just like, oh, <laughs> Um, really exciting. Now, you know, I've got to say it, the other place we're using it lots is marketing and in terms of writing, right, and content writing, but even coming up with the names of something, you know, you've got a certain little mini program you're doing and it can brainstorm names. It can even break, brainstorm the steps you'll deliver the program on and all sorts of stuff. You know, there's so much there and there's lots of people out there with helpful tips and prompts. You know, there's a guy that'll help you with prompts for chat GPT for how to write a TEDx talk. There's, I mean, there's just so much out there, right? Whereas I feel like my take up in other areas, and that might be in um, maybe in advice or portfolios or even in compliance, you know, is hampered a bit by the how to do it. Like, how could we possibly use this tool? Um, because I know there's value there, but I'm just not sure how to go about it. I'm sort of curious about, you know, for each of you and James, maybe starting with you, what's your take on what's blocking more take up for you across all the different parts of the business? You know, what do you think the blockage is there for really going hard um, yeah. on AI? I mean, absolutely agree. For my, us, marketing has been a, a really obvious starting point And I mean, you're talking about that business coaching community. We're starting to see everyone else in across different businesses using different, different using it for different reasons. And and I guess it's that the, the part of the how to is um, really. I mean, you think about Canva from a marketing perspective, bringing in magic design. Yes, what they're doing is an epic job in educating and keeping users informed, and and so it's a really easy uptake. So. Yeah. I guess it's critical when we're trying to absorb all this new tech and we're busy in the day to day that how to needs to be accessible. Yes. And if it is, I think we're likely to more likely to take it up. Um, yeah, that's I think, fair. You know, there's also probably still something in how adaptive you are to change, uh, and maybe that take of new, you know, very powerful tech. Uh, and I know you lean into this stuff, Peter. Mm -hmm. And but but it moves so bloody quickly, right? Yeah. It's hard for us to keep up. And yeah. and so you think about. For a lot of people, I can imagine it is a turn off because it's moving so fast. You know, I start here. How do I? How do I keep up? Yeah. Or so many people are already on the train. But I would say just just lean into it at, at wherever you are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you think about every everyone with kind of different levels of maybe resistance to it. 
I, I tend to lean pretty hard on this stuff and, and you'll catch me watching videos, listening to podcasts first thing in the morning, late at night, that type of thing. Yeah. And and maybe it's just also chatting with people in social settings. Um, we were at the pub the other night after a 40th birthday and someone was coming. He's like, oh, he's going to chat GPT instead of Google. And that wasn't me, but I was like, yeah, that's kind of what we do now. Yeah, um, <laughs> for lots of things, yeah. And that's, I mean, maybe that's where you get your how-to as well, but I think- there's yeah, I think it's it's seeing a clear path and then knowing all you need to do is have a crack and all of a sudden the world is is a very different place. Yeah. Tristan, what about for you guys? What do you think is one of the you know, the key blockage or a couple of blockages for you of, of sort of more take up across the firm? Yeah, I think it's really about having the time to be able to uh, figure out what will work for your business, how to apply it, and then um, how to apply it broadly across across the team. So yeah. um, we've got a, an internal team that's responsible for process improvement. Um, so they're, act- they're actively looking at uh, a couple of Microsoft AI uh, products. So uh, Copilot being one of them. Mm-hmm. I think Microsoft Syntex is another in terms of um, you know, share file management, things like that. So, yeah. Uh, look at it in terms of capability, um, what can work for our business, and then it's rolling it out to the to the team more broadly. I think it's really important to have a focused approach to it. Work out what you want to be achieving from that process, um, and then put a plan in place. Because um, yeah, it's all it's all well and good to have a a broad knowledge of it, but yeah. you know, for to get the best out of these um, uh, these softwares, uh, you really need to. Um, drill into the detail of it. So understanding you know, how exactly uh, Copilot can interact with PowerPoint and Excel, um, and what that means from you know, doing client presentations and analyzing data. Um, it's not for everyone to do, but it's for uh, you know, some specific people in our business to, to lead that charge and then uh, distribute the knowledge. Yeah, look, I um, uh, sort of Copilot was sort of next on my questions. It's... um. You know, staff productivity in terms of of you know the synchronization of things they're using, um, and of course the tools a lot of people use a lot of the time are the Microsoft Suite. You know, any any and all of them, in, you know, Outlook and Word and Excel and all these sort of things. Um, you know, it's the first time. So this Copilot is the first time I've been jealous of Microsoft users. We're a G Suite office, and up to this point, I've been ner 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 ner, ner to anybody that has to use <laughs> Microsoft until now. Where I'm like, oh, this is where we're going to get some cool stuff because how many times have you got to take something from Excel to Word to like this this in full integration and sort of fluidity of information and tasks and even prompts that will be going to be able to come up, um, I think will be so powerful. So I are either so Tristan, are you guys on Copilot yet? Presumably you're investigating it at the very least. Yeah, we're we're having a look at it. Um, yeah. we're we're not on it yet. Um, I've done a, a couple of things on the the free version, but it's um, a slither of what you can get. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're looking at how it. Uh, plays into preparation uh, of advice documents, you know, particularly formatting. They can get yes. really finicky sometimes. Yeah. Um, power, PowerPoint documents, you know, being able to code without having to know how to actually code, mm. um, workflows, uh, drafting emails. The the possibilities are, are really quite enormous with it. Um, we're, we're really excited by it, um, and I think it, it does have – uh, some good applications, and, and particularly being under Microsoft's uh, data and privacy policies, that yep. that's important for us because we're looking at, at really sensitive uh, information here. So, you know, you, you can't or you shouldn't be putting client information into ChatGPT. Um, yeah, you know, you may well be able to under Copilot. Yeah, yep, hundred percent. How about you, James? Are you guys? Do you, first of all, you use Microsoft? Do you use the suite? Uh, no, we are Google freaks as okay. well. Um, so you have envy as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a quick Google just tells me that Google Duet may be something that's uh, that's comparable, but I'm I'm uh, unqualified to comment any further. I think yeah. So Duet is <laughs> definitely the the um, the alternative. 
for for Google. I think it's a little behind Microsoft. No, yeah. Um, yeah. Microsoft bought OpenAI or a good portion of it, as I understand. And once again, please fact check me, listeners. Um, but as I understand it, they're getting a lot of that insight. Um, and but I, I'm pretty confident that Google will get on the case. You know, I figure those guys have a lot of techie people that can get on this and get get moving. Um, but I do think. Look, for anybody out there, um, having taken a look at Microsoft now, having seen this and just looked at it just for when I'm even speaking, I get asked questions. The actual power of this will be beyond the big four, uh, you know, the so Outlook, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, which is, you know, the, the common ones that everybody's using. It'll be when you go even further into the other some 30 apps that you get when you get the Microsoft suite. They've got so many there that very few of us take or very few practices take advantage of. And the more you can sort of immerse everybody's day-to-day in Microsoft generally, the more value you'll get out of Copilot. You know, it'll be one of those situations where leaning in will make a huge difference. Um, my little sister recently, she texts me and she knows I love tech. Oh, Peter, what's the to-do I should, you know, to-do app I should get? You know, she's got a new job. She wants to really get into it and perform well. And they're on my Microsoft. I said, oh, you should just check out, check out Microsoft to do. It's already in the in the suite you've got. And she turned it on and within seconds, it's already added from her Outlook all of the to-dos it can see that exist through her emails. And she's like, dang, I've now got 100 tasks. Like it's already <laughs> within her just turning the thing on. But that's the point, right? It can read them and it knows which of those things and even sometimes the dates they're due and all sorts of things, you know. So, you know, I think immersing, if you've got the opportunity, and it's clearly James and I will be, be doing that with Google, but um, but I think whichever one of these uh, you're in, just check out everything. Check out what, you've, what you're what you paying for, to be honest. You know, I think yeah. most people don't realize how much they get with that Microsoft little membership bill they get every month. And um, I, think, I think with how fast, that, I mean, with the exponential nature of this now and how it's moving, it, it is very difficult to keep up. Yeah. And the the idea there would be if you can implement incredibly quickly and get your head across it, you'll see something that works that, that everyone else hasn't. Yeah. And and it'll just, you know, from an internal perspective, from a selfish perspective, you're looking at our business, we can get ahead now because of that. Yeah. And you'll stumble across things that, that haven't made the news, that aren't in Google yet necessarily. And um, because everyone's kind of at the forefront at the same time in mm. a way. And so I think, you know, when you niche it down to financial advice specifically, we're talking about this with no idea where it's going in the next no. few No. Right. You know, absolutely. And I do think the one thing I would say to any of the listeners out there, you're in advice land, you know, you're not in sort of product or fundamental or whatever land, is my belief is for all the um, institutions that we all work alongside can do some wonderful stuff with these tools. And particularly in some of the research things, I have some seen some pretty cool stuff, Tristan, that they're doing internally to try and get the client facing information that's cool and all that sort of stuff using AI. So I know that exists, but yep. I think this is one of those moments in time where it's an advantage as an individual, as a as a small business, not an institution. You know, institutions yeah. struggle to get their head around this stuff. And what if our people ask yep. it a question and it tells them something wrong? And what if, you know, they like their heads explode uh, with tech like this? We have an opportunity to lean in and be nimble and compete at a rate that they just want to be able to keep up with. So I think, you know, we've all got to sort of, recognize that advantage and sort of really take it and bank it um, while yeah, we and, can. And ultimately what we want to achieve is giving advisors more time and space to do just that advice yeah. because yeah. that's that's what we're good at. It's what we enjoy doing. It's what our clients engage us to do. So don't don't lose sight of, of that focus. You're not here to be an AI expert. You're here no. to know enough about AI to support your your function uh, as an advisor or manager or planner, yeah. or wh- whatever your role is. Yeah, for sure. Now, interestingly, you know, it's natural with any new tech um, and generative AI falls into this absolutely is it's, oh, let's supercharge the practice. Let's get more clients, more volume, more money. You know, like it's <laughs> it growth, 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 right? Um, but, 
you know, one thing actually I can see sort of beyond productivity is a lift in staff morale. You know, if we can get rid of some of the really dull and menial and repetitive and downright boring, let's be frank, tasks um, that are done in the practice, then I think it can really lift the weight of staff. And I'm curious, um, let's start with you, James. Have you seen any evidence of that so far? Anything that you think's got a bit more fun to do? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some really simple ones is is the idea. I mean, at the moment, our Aussie team does a lot of checking emails for our offshore team, for example, um, and and just drafts uh, before they go to clients. And I mean, this is a task that you couldn't get rid of quick enough. <laughs> and so, I mean, anyone really, and and it and it doesn't matter because I mean, the the idea of chat GPT is it's so easy to get the the grammar right. Yeah, and you can. I mean, everyone knows this probably listening, but. But for anyone who's not aware, you can literally say, give me the following. This is what I want to say. And it might be that English is your second language, but this is what I want to say in English, but give it to me in Australian English, mm. a little bit relaxed for my young client base. And then boom, it gives it to you. It's not perfectly grammatically correct, like we wouldn't ever speak to a client, uh, but you can tweak that even those little bits. You can tweak those little bits of prompting, like you were saying earlier, to really nail that. And I think- I mean, other obvious parts, obviously, anyone who's ever taken notes in a meeting um, <laughs> yeah. can, can, can see the benefit of this part working for you. In And, and of course, those, I mean, that's all direct links to morale. Morale can be, can be shifted in a whole bunch of ways, but, yeah. but doing boring work is yeah. uh, certainly one thing that, you know. A hundred percent. Completely agree. How about you, Tristan? Have you seen any of that in terms of sort of lifting the energy level at all or, or relief? Like <sighs> that made life easier? Yeah, I think certainly uh, using code, whether it's macros or through Microsoft uh, workflows, we've been able to automate a lot of the the manual tasks. So if I think about when I started as a fresh-faced graduate, uh, we were doing uh, monthly or quarterly statements uh, printing them all out, stapling a cover letter on top, putting them in the post, you know, chucking some stamps on it, going down to yeah. the post office. Um, it took it a, an, an enormous amount of time. Um, and now we've got uh, its internally written code, um, but it pulls together um, all the different pieces of information, reports that we want to send, and then um, we've got a, an automated um, PM, emailing function. So that, that's been something that, has uh, reduced a, a lot of time. Um, likewise, yeah. uh, writing flows that yeah. push along um, uh, you know, regular workflows, payments, and um, you know, things like that uh, through Microsoft Planner. Um, that's been a, a good uh, a good improvement for us. Um, so I think one of the things we're going to look at uh, a bit more is being able to write code without having to know code, yeah. um, you know, be able to do it with a you know, normal English language. Uh, that's something that I think we'll probably look to leverage off a bit more. Yeah, hundred percent. I completely agree. I mean, the power, I know, um, chat GPT, for example, has just added a Teams function. So, I mean, for my version of four to date, I had I had put in the background my tone, the niche I wanted, wanted to talk to in 2024, um, the context of that, uh, what they expect from me, how I talk to them, all sorts of stuff. And and even some some general approaches or names I've got for the way we do things, and it's injecting that without me even asking now when I ask it for either a LinkedIn post or an intro email or anything. Like it just is injecting all these things in. And now that they've added teams, well, I'll be able to get another member of the team to do that, you know, to ask, given that context, they can then write it as, you know, the intro email, like all that sort of stuff. And I think for yeah. team, like this stuff is fun for them too, right? Like I think it's I think this could just make life that bit more interesting for everybody as they're going forward. And and I think we'd all say that one of the things you do use when you're junior and you're starting out, actually writing is tough, right? Because um storytelling comes with experience. And so I think tools that can help with that actually, we're probably underrating how powerful that is for new entrants. Um, to be able to bring in storytelling and even like what's the tone of the practice? How do you guys talk? I mean, James, I know you've got language you guys use, um, you know, sufficient and like all sorts of things that you use part of your language. Yeah. For somebody to get up to scratch on that really quickly just through using some sort of GPT, you know, I think that's super powerful. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we, 
you just prompted me around, again around this. Like we've got we we have got fifty two thousand words in behind what we're trying to do now and trying to create this book that we've been writing for a few years. Yeah, and I mean loading that in and telling it to speak like we do. Yes. Phenomenal. It is. And in fact, authors now, I know Michael McQueen just launched a new book and he's got a um, a GPT that, that you can ask it questions and it's basically got the book loaded up and you can interact with it. Um, and, and it can teach you like it's like it's a coach, like, oh, right. This stuff's amazing. <laughs> now, in terms of, um, you know, the key barriers, and we sort of talked about ours individually on and folks listening along at home, um, way out the back then of the report on page 43, I think it was, let me just go through, it is 43. Then it does talk about for most, pra- you know, of all the people they surveyed, Netwell surveyed what they feel the barriers are to implementing AI. And so I'd love to ask each of you, I'll start. And one of them for me, which does pop up here is pretty high percentage. I think it's 39% of the people I surveyed is this sort of lack of integration with existing systems. You know, the extent to which particularly financial advice systems um, may or may not be on this game, you know, depending on who you're using and what tools you use as part of your business, then it can um, just get it, it you can hit that wall, right? Like that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, And I think for me, the other one is a trusted IT partner. I mean, you might have an IT partner who helps with your, like, you know, your email and your, like some some IT when IT was about hardware um, and things like that. But I think as we go forward, we are going to need to start collecting a few experts that can help us navigate these things um, so that we move beyond chat GPT and tools like that to our own GPTs and our own tools that service as a practice. So those sort of were mine that I see as my blockages of that list. Um, Tristan, for you, were there any there that stood out for you as, yeah, I can see that being a real challenge for you yourself? Yeah, I think if if we fast forward to, you know, 2029 and AI is kind of being used, you know, pretty widespread or in a widespread manner, um, I think the big thing that we as an industry need to be mindful of is privacy and yeah. security. So we're dealing with, you know, really sensitive financial information, whether it's you know, uh, TFNs or uh, you know, people's passports, driver's yeah. licenses, things like that. You know, Medibank, uh, Optus. You know, yeah. the list the, is long. If, if we ever look at our, our IT security reports, um, you know, every day you're getting multiple attacks on your business from, you know, all over the globe. Yeah. You know, you need to make sure that whatever uh, AI service you're using, um, it is you know as good as Fort Knox in terms of the uh, the privacy and um, security of that information, and that also comes down to training, doesn't it? Because the thing I've learned from the cyber guys is is it, the humans are the ones that mess this stuff up, right? <laughs> so we might have a great tool, but then we we do something wrong with it, or or we we click on the link we shouldn't have, or whatever the human activity is that just makes the house of cards fall apart. So I guess you know what goes alongside that is some really continual training of our teams as we go, yep. really making yep. sure they understand the tools, understand the limitations um, and the risks uh, as we go forward. Yep. A really cool um, a really cool thing I stumbled across. I haven't watched all of it, but it's the the OpenAI Dev Day and there's a YouTube video which is like the opening keynote. And right. this is all about kind of what's coming. They talk about monetizing apps. They're talking about all sorts of fun stuff, but – one of the key messages that was really good in that was the incremental implementation is still so crucial. So when you talk about the security of it, it's one step at a time. As the, although it's moving incredibly quickly, just sl- like not slowing it down. Take but a just, breath. Yeah. Oh, don't let it all run off. Yeah. Right. And it's it still is. so human driven by what we ask it to do. Yes. So to speak, and it is a very general term, right? But yeah. Um, I mean, I think for us, it's it is the hows again. It's how the hell does it integrate? Like you said, Peter, mm. um, we've already got everything running and working. And do we have to change it all or not? What does that look like? Um, how quickly can you access it and and use it? I think in terms of a barrier, is it is it easy? Uh, is it easy enough to just quickly learn? Um, and and again, as much as we hate thinking and dwelling on this, it's so important. Is does it fit within the regulatory compliance yeah. framework? we're working within as well. And they're going to struggle. It's just a fact that they're already struggling. You know, the governments yep. around the world are struggling with this stuff. So, you know, it's it's um, it's not going to be clear 
from them. It's going to, we're all going to have to sort of use it, uh, sensible hats on this stuff. Um, but I think it'll be the natural. I mean, just like, you know, I'll never forget when, you know, websites were a new thing and, and the, the group I was with said, would you just, don't, we don't want you to have websites. It's too risky. Now, if you think about right now, how ludicrous that statement seems, right? Yeah. But there's fear and there's, it's, it's, and I think actually risk assessment, like our ability to, uh, to truly understand and assess the risks, we're just going to have to get better and better at that um, going forward. And it does mean we'll have to ask more questions and learn some language maybe we didn't know before or, you know, all that sort of stuff so that we can be making sure we're across this stuff. I mean, one of the barriers to me that, that isn't here that I think we're all hitting, um, but probably no matter what type of business we have is, is, you know, we can build a absolute race car of a business and we can have all this stuff working really well and it can be fantastic and humming and we can have saved huge amounts of time and the client experience is fantastic. But the minute it hits, you know, the back office of a provider that is still only accepting your forms of a particular type that need to get submitted via post from Harry Potter's bloody owl delivery service or whatever, (laughs) the strange and unusual (laughs) environment is from many of the you know the providers we deal with all sorts of different types i have to admit that is going to be interesting as we go forward because the gap between their back office and ours is probably going to get wider for a while um and they're just going to be going what you want us to what you know like, that seems no, no we can't do that well come on you know <laughs> let's pick 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 up the speed folks so i think that will be a barrier i think because they will hold us back to a certain extent until we can get that sort of snowball moving um and sort of drag yep. them along with us agree i was interested to see cost there um as a barrier and and i guess just wondering because there's so many good free add-ons and you know things like chat gpt are not expensive i know if you get stuck into the development side of things i'm sure there's some cost there but i mean maybe for these these bigger businesses they are able to I mean, for for the benefit that it's bringing, mm. surely the savings and the cost, the cost, um, the cost savings around all of that uh, should be pretty obvious. I think that sort of brings back, though, brings us back to a, a point Tristan you made earlier, which is really know the problem you're solving before you start. So really, have identified what is the thing that is the barrier or the blockage or the whatever, bottleneck, whatever it is that's this thing you're trying to fix and find a solution for it potentially using a tool that uses AI because then you can do that cost-benefit analysis. You know, well, well, it's currently taking blah, 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 and this many people or whatever it is. And by yep. doing this, it may have an upfront cost, but wow, we're saving $20,000 a year. <laughs> it can be applied elsewhere or whatever that is. So I think you're right. It's 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 solving problems you know you have um, probably is a starting yep. point uh, rather than chasing the squirrel, which is, you know, it's certainly a problem I have um, with this stuff. And I'm curious then, Tristan, because I know you've sort of um, previously with NetWorld sessions they've done, you've talked about your approach in the practice to implementation um, and continual ap- improvement. And I think, you know, you use a, a, a Kaizen. Am I saying that right? Kaizen? Yeah, yeah. Where you we think of it from a, a continuous improvement uh, perspective, which is um, the the case and principle that, okay, you, okay. that you're so, referring and, to. Yeah. So, for, in terms of say projects like this, then what does that mean in reality for you? So, is it is it that little step by step approach, or what does it mean in terms of the way you you look at some new opportunities that might pop up due to AI? Yeah. So, I, I think James touched on a good point before. A lot of this is incremental. You're not going to have this one big bang. Um, solution that's going to solve all of your problems at, at the one at the one time. So for us, it's really you know, planning, finding out what the problem is, looking at the different options, um, you know, pick what you think is the best option, test it, implement it, and then you know, review the success of it. Yeah. So yeah. it's that kind of continual continual cycle. Um, so we'll be looking at, you know, as I said, Copilot to start with. Um, we'll be looking at you know, perhaps how that integrates with you know, uh, Outlook yeah. to begin with. You know, figure out what, what we want to do, um, how we're going to do it, and then you know, test it. And then you roll it out from there. So making sure that things are, are done properly, I think, is key to success in, in all of this. Otherwise, you'll just have a hodgepodge of uh, people doing different things. And as a business that wants to be efficient, that's not such a great uh, starting point. 
It's really not, is it? And and certainly, um, I mean, we've, like I said, we use Guru, but it's, you know, the way we do things. And I think, you know, this will be just another one of the way we all do things. <laughs> so to have yeah. more than a policy, it's a, this folds into all of your processes, all of your, pol- like you just make it clear, hey, when we do this, this is the first step and we use that tool and we ask Copilot this and we, you know, like just, it's just going to have to be part of um, the way we train people. And I mean, the good news for yeah. you for you with Microsoft is they're going to have 4 trillion YouTube videos on their channel that will help with that stuff. So in terms of training, I think you'll be well served uh, for yeah, your that staff. Might be- that might be a trillion too many for me, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. I think, um, I mean, somebody literally said to me the other day, but Peter, you know, it was about, I think it was Outlook. Oh, but what could it possibly do? And I'm like, I just went straight to Microsoft and in their channel, you know, just searched, uh, you know, yeah. Copilot and Outlook. And of course, like it's just there. So I think um, for some of this stuff, we can probably make it harder than it needs to be. You know, yeah. um, yep. there's so there's stuff at a resource, but I agree with you. Rolling this out in a really structured way is going to make such a difference um, to, you know, how we approach it. Now, James, for you, I'm sort of curious. You know, virtual, um, like our practice, how often do you either get the team together or or meet, you know, virtually as a team to sort of talk and implement new projects? You know, how do you keep everybody on track for this type of stuff? That's not that sort of day to day client work or normal course of business work, but are these projects, how do you guys do that? So for us, and it's an interesting thing thinking about AI because I'm not sure they're I'm not sure they're big projects like we've just been talking about. These are small, get it in place, test it, try it, move forward. But yep. in type of project for us, um, we're talking about these at our monthly all in. So we get everyone in the team from the mortgage broking side as well as the financial planning side together. Uh, and you know, different people present on different things, and this is one of the the topics, the repeated gender items, I guess, is we call them big rocks. Yep. And we'll only ever work on three at a time, and so this has come from you know some coaching and some help to really just stop, stop and say you can't have a million different things on the go at a time, and so if they're bigger projects, three at a time, but really that then boils down to that's our kind of three or four month run. We know we've got three. We want to smash those in the next few months. And then if there's smaller projects that pop up, then, you know, we can th- we can jump on that. We've got resources if we need to, to get onto those. And that might be the new AI tech. Um, so when we, when we, I mean, it's not AI, but when we moved to Slack more recently from Voxer and a couple of other things we were doing, um, I'm very glad we did, by the way, <laughs> the, the, I mean, it was a, a trial and test with a couple of people announce it to the team that we're trialing it, see how it goes compared to what we were using. Within a few days, everyone's like, what the hell have we been doing? This is the future. <laughs> yeah. We moved on. Yeah. Um, but then it's about, well, where do you go from there? And so you can do, you can break it down a little bit, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, we've got a bit of an annual rhythm now around okay. those kind of bigger rocks. So we get yep. the team input around September, August, September. Uh, and we did that in the first all in uh, that we had that time last year. Everyone kind of contributed what what's not working? Where are the opportunities? Did a bit of a SWOT analysis, got everything together. Okay, what do we do about it? Threw it all up against the wall, and then we went into kind of a bigger planning session uh, as just the directors, and and then kind of used what we got from the team to then drive where we're going. Yeah, um, yeah. and keeping on track. Uh, Basecamp, uh, we are using Basecamp, the project management tool, awesome uh, for most things. Yeah, and uh, we're also big fans of our. Um, off the system, out of the computer screen, uh, Kanban board. Yep. So we use that essentially. That's our process for getting things done. Yeah. We've got lots of little post-its with all the tasks and all the options across those three big projects, um, but only three things will ever make it to the list for that for that day. Yeah. Uh, and those are, okay, annual all the way down to 25-minute tasks. Little wins. Yeah. Yeah, and look, it's it's a um, everybody's got to find their rhythm with this stuff, um, and you're going to get it wrong about six times before you get it right for your business. It truly is down to how everybody how it suits everybody. But I think um, the biggest mistake we can all make if we own a, or run a practice is is setting this stuff for other people. That's the biggest mistake I used to say. Look, this is what we're doing without without um, you know bringing them together and asking because what. I missed was gems, you know, these gems that they're just putting up with stuff that is a pain in the neck for them and is absorbing huge amounts of time. They just figure it's part of their job and we could fix easily. 
There's so many of that. I, and every practice I go to, I know I can find those. Like, guys, we're asking the wrong people. Stop talking to the advisors for a little bit. Talk to the rest of the team and there's going to be stuff that's really hard and annoying. You know, So I think um, I agree with you. The more we can interact um, with the teams and then come up with the plan, um, the more power, powerful I think the outcome um, for all of us. Uh, now, we, you know, I've got you guys here together. I feel like I have to ask this question. I think I know the, the answer, but there will be some listeners um, who may be concerned that actually as this progresses, as generative AI goes even further and, you know, basically turns into the term Terminator. No, I'm kidding. Um, but as it goes further down the track, you know, is there a possibility that AI could replace the need to seek financial advice from people like us. So starting with with you, Tristan, what's your take on that? Do you think that it's ever likely that that we'll be replaced entirely? Yeah, I think robo advice probably came to the fore maybe six or seven years ago. And there was a hmm. lot of talk then as to the future of the advisor role. Um yep. we're all we're all still here. Uh yeah. we're all still got clients. Yeah. Um I think ultimately people want to be advised by another person. And you know, particularly when there are things happening in markets or in their lives where you need uh, a, a face-to-face conversation to talk you through that and coach you through that, you're not going to get that from a, from a computer. So yeah. I think the, the best advisors will be those that are able to uh, leverage up this type of technology and integrate it into their uh, their current business, um, and then give themselves the the time and ability to uh, you know, demonstrate their skills to the to the client. Um, right. You know, you need to be adding value; otherwise, yeah. there's no point you being there. So, yeah. I think um, you know, using AI to uh, create a better client um, experience um, uh, that will be an add on to the advisor. Uh, business, but um, I don't think it. I hope it it won't replace um, advisors themselves. Yeah, for sure. What, I agree. And yeah, I think, what's your take, James? I'm curious. I, was, I mean, I, was, I guess there was a scary time when robo advice started to be bandied around a bit because <laughs> we hadn't gone through this experience of okay, there it is, and people still want people. Yeah, and now we have that right. We have the systems in place that are incredible. Um, we've all heard that term, bionic advisor. This is that idea of you can can wrap yourself like Iron Man with all yeah. the cool tools, but ultimately underneath it, there is a human with EQ with an ability to have real human conversations. And and I think there's a strange thing, and I, I don't know, maybe one day this will disappear in one way or another, but I think there's this thing that, I mean, we could see it from the mortgage broking side of things. And we were, as if we were concerned about either side of our business, it was that part where you can search for a loan and find a loan and go online and apply for yourself very quickly, people are still using mortgage brokers, if not more than they ever have before. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when um, Ubank first came up with their online offering. Uh, this is many years ago, and and it was going to be the world changer at the time, um, you know, and, oh, everybody's going to apply for loans online. And they, they, they got lots of clicks and very low conversion because once people worked out the process they had to go through and the amount of info and like it, it's harder than they think, you know. Now, interestingly, that will be easier now as data sweeps and other things can happen. But, but I agree. I think, I think though we, the thing that I'm now acknowledging is we are no longer in an information game. Information is easily accessible. It's everywhere. Even context now. I mean, you think about what ChatGPT can do. So even context, maybe that's going to start taking over from tools like generative AI. But I think true prioritization, reassurance, inspiration, um, true clarity, you know, getting them to snap out of whatever funk they're in um, as a client. And that can be caused of all sorts of things. And I think accountability, interestingly, because there are tools out there that that are pure tech that are for accountability, but it's so easy to just turn them off, you know, whereas a human be- being you feel accountable to, so you, you feel accountable to your advisor to achieve a goal and you feel like they're going to be disappointed in you if you don't step up, 
there's some power to that. You know, like that. Yep. That's only human tech. I don't think tech will ever be able to make us feel truly disappointed in ourselves. You know, like, like we've. I think that element of humanity is going to be very difficult to replicate. So I do think it means it's going to shift necessarily the role. I I do honestly think that it will shift what we will all be doing down the track or how we're doing it. But I'm with you guys. I don't think it's disappearing. I think I think humans need humans and and it's just that we need to be clear what we don't need to be providing anymore. Look, I've taken up so much of your time. Are there any final tips, tricks, warnings you share from your sort of adventures in generative AI so far? Tristan, what would you uh, share with the audience as, as warning signs or, or any tips you have? Yeah, I, I think uh, we've kind of spoken about this variously, you know, both yourself and, and James. Um, plan, um, figure out what your pain points are, and then yeah. figure out what the priorities are to address. Otherwise, um, you'll have no direction um, in where you're going or how you're applying it. Um, and then, you know, once you've finished doing whatever you're doing, you won't be able to figure out whether it was su- successful or not. So plan, test, implement, review. Awesome. How about you, James? What, what would you leave as a, a tip for the audience? I think time in it is is still crucial, right? This isn't something that you can spend five minutes in between meetings trying to figure out. So it is almost a you need to enjoy the process of learning about this. And yeah. You need to lean into that. And so you've got to make the time to – and it might be a Saturday, right? It might be this is after hours. This is you're just playing around. How the hell can I use this better? And then the ideas will start to flow. But if you don't give it a few hours at a time, maybe it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and and probably the last thing is like you said, the post-it note, Peter, <laughs> is there an AI option for this? Is there an AI step that I could put in place of what I'm about to do to solve for this? And there will be. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Particularly if you're in Microsoft and you get to, you know, and you take on board um, as it rolls out Copilot, um, you keep on asking yourself that because it's tools you're ever, already using. This is not getting you, like, it's not asking you to get trained up in something you don't use. You're already using it. Just get a bit curious and keep on asking yourself, is there a way we could be doing this better with the tools we have? Um, yep. I think uh, the other thing I'd leave with everybody with is, is um, you know, social media is our friend in this space only because if you start following people that talk about this stuff, you'll see more of it. So on LinkedIn, my feed is full of generative AI prompts and all sorts of stuff because I started following some people that did that. So it just means it'll pop up in front of you. It doesn't mean it's it's the single authority, but you'll just start being aware of, right? And some of that will help uh, with all of this is you'll just, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I've seen that before, right? So just to get a bit more comfortable. Um, and honestly, you know, share what you tried on things like the Ensemble platform. Um, ask the question, hey, I was going to do this. What do you guys think? Uh, the more we interact um, amongst each other, then then we all don't need to reinvent the wheel here, folks. Um, then the better exactly. off we'll be. I don't think this is one of those things. We are not in competition on this as advisors. There's not enough of us with there's too many people we need to serve. I say bandy together and let's get all the value out of tools like AI um, and yep. share them because we've got too many people to look after. All righty, Advice Explorers. If you'd like to find out more about the Net Wealth Advice Tech Report, please, the um, re- all the resources and the links and everything are in the show notes. Um, and there's additional resources there aside from just the report. So check it out. I've also popped in Tristan and James's LinkedIn details. Um, if you had a specific question about them or their business or what they do, then I'm sure they wouldn't mind you nudging them on LinkedIn um, and asking them a question. Gents, thank you so much for joining us here today. I really um, love hearing your sort of journey of AI adoption and, and sharing your experience with the rest of the Ensemble community. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Tristan. Appreciate it. Oof, we covered a lot there, folks, but I'm hoping it really got you thinking about your approach to AI and generative AI, ChatGPT, all these tools. Um you know, keep the conversation going on the Ensemble platform. Keep asking, keep, you know, maybe you want to have a, a monthly get together with a group of advisors online and all chat about what you've been doing. Like any way we can crowdsource this, I think is really, really positive. So definitely keep the conversation going. Now, next week, I will be back to interview an advice tech provider. 
Um, and we'll also provide you with another Curiosity Corner tip then, I promise. But this has already been a long episode. I'm conscious of your time. Um, but And please keep those uh, voice messages coming, folks. I'm really loving them. There's some hysterical ones there that you've sent through. Um, as a, you know, it's a, such a lovely send off for me. Feel free to send me a speak pipe message. The link is in the show notes. Um, you've been including, you know, some strange habits or ticks I've got and all sorts of funny things that you remember from my time hosting the podcast. So I love to hear it all. So feel free to head over to speakpipe.com forward slash piece D P E I T A D. And just let me have it folks. Give it to me straight. I'd love to hear it. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. Now, we're rapidly coming up to March, whew, already nearly moments away, and that will include International Women's Day. Uh, and right now, I do have just one or two, one at least, maybe two slots still available. Uh, so if you would like an engaging session for your International Women's Day event, then uh, I've got a keynote, Her Financial Drum Roll from Financial Literacy to Unparalleled Economic Leader where we sort of delve into a really crucial narrative. You know, this the startling scarcity of women in key economic decision-making roles across industries, despite, you know, their proven success and even capabilities. Um, we'll explore how financial literacy can be a real game changer. In fact, a foundational beat that really leads to significant roles in economic leadership. You know, if you're keen to understand and really challenge this disparity and join a conversation that empowers and really inspires your community, then it doesn't matter if you're a small workplace or even a bigger group. I'd love to chat further on how Taylor Swift, yes, the sequin lady herself, can bring incredible insights to your audience. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. 